It's been 18 years since Patrick Madrid and Pete Veer published More Catholic Than the Pope, an inside look at extreme traditionalism. Today we're going to take a trip down memory lane and revisit this work in light of almost two decades of development in the church and the traditionalist movement. The landscape for Catholic traditionalists was vastly different in 2004. Traditionalist Catholics could only access the Mass through indult communities established under Ecclesia Dei or through the SSPX. John Paul II was on the chair of Peter and George W. Bush was presiding over the reconstruction of the global order following 9-11 along the lines of neocon globalism. This was the high watermark of Wegelian Catholicism, a bizarre union of JP2 pop Catholicism with American neoconservatism. To many Catholics, traditionalists seemed like a small, insignificant reactionary force whose gripes were ultimately irrelevant. Because, after all, the good guys were in charge. The problem was not the Pope or the Church, but that liberals were not being obedient to the Pope or the Church. The Church's problems could be solved with greater reverence for the Pope's teaching and a more robust implementation of the Second Vatican Council. These measures, it was assured, would lead to a new springtime for the Church. Traditionalism was thus not only numerically insignificant, but ideologically unnecessary. It was a different world for Catholic media as well. We were in the waning years of the Catholic Answers EWTN monopoly on English language Catholic commentary. Blogging was brand new and trad blogs were few and far between. Most of the best known traditional blogs and websites had not yet been started. And as YouTube would not be founded for another year, trad vlogs and even footage of traditional masses was more difficult to come by. And of course, the mainstream Catholic media never gave traditionalism more than a passing mention, usually as a descanted, caricaturized foil against which to prop up the copium of pop Catholicism. Traditional-minded Catholics, myself included, often felt isolated, unaware that millions of other Catholics around the world shared our concerns and frustrations. It was into this milieu that Our Sunday Visitor published More Catholic Than the Pope in 2004. At the time, Patrick Madrid was one of the kingpins of American Catholic apologetics, along with Carl Keating and Jimmy Aiken. Now, I have absolutely nothing against Patrick Madrid from what I know of him. He seems to be a good and sincere man who, at least to me, has always come across as intellectually honest. And he has a sweet last name. The other author, Pete Veer, is a Canadian and former member of the SSPX, hence the book's title, An Inside Look at Extreme Traditionalism. I know nothing of Mr. Veer. His biography is still listed on the Catholic Answers website, but it looks like he has not published anything since 2008. So I have no axe to grind with either of these authors. I am coming at this work from a position of true neutrality. As we might expect from a work on this subject published at this time in history, this book leaves a lot to be desired. The problems begin right from the title, an inside look at extreme traditionalism. Now, by labeling some traditionalism as extreme, the book is inferring that there is a kind of traditionalism that is not extreme. For example, suppose I say that we are going to discuss radical Mormonism. This implies the existence of a mainstream Mormonism, a Mormonism that is not radical and that can provide an ideological default against which we can measure the claims of radical Mormonism. We couldn't hope to understand radical Mormonism unless we first understood regular Mormonism. Ergo, to understand the claims and arguments of extreme traditionalism, we should have a grounding in what constitutes normal or mainstream traditionalism. This is sadly lacking from the book, which spends the bulk of its content responding to matters specifically pertaining to the SSPX, which is identified with extreme traditionalism. Now, that's fine. If Madrid and Veer want to write a book rebutting the claims of the SSPX, it is within their prerogative as authors to choose the subject matter of their own book. The problem is is that it falls into a pit common to many mainstream books that purport to tackle traditionalism. 
Marxist. While claiming to address extreme traditionalism as represented by the SSPX, it goes on to malign traditionalism as a whole, as if the entire traditionalist movement were equivalent to the SSPX. There is no discussion of mainstream traditionalism because I don't believe that Madrid and Veer knew where the dividing line was between acceptable traditionalism and extreme traditionalism, or at least they didn't know where it was in 2004. For example, Madrid and Veer offer rebuttals to the accusation that Vatican II was illegitimate, and that's fine, but where does that leave Catholics who acknowledge that Vatican II was a legitimate council but a council that was unnecessary, disastrous, or ambiguous in its content. The book argues that the Novus Ordo is a valid mass, and that's fine, most traditionalists will acknowledge this anyway. But what about those who say it is a valid mass, but drastically inferior to the traditional Latin mass, a liturgy that bears little resemblance to the historic Roman rite? Again, silence. Now. Again, if they don't want to address these points, fine, but how can we understand extreme traditionalism without some reference to regular traditionalism? Madrid and Veer essentially set up a false dichotomy between the SSPX on the one hand and regular old Novus Ordo Catholicism on the other, as if the rejection of the former entails embracing the latter. There can be no other options. The rad trad arguments brought forward for rebuttal are straw men, weak positions that you typically don't find trads defending anymore. Vatican II was illegitimate. The council was pastoral and therefore has no authority. Quo primum says the Pope can never change the liturgy. The Novus Ordo's invalid. And so on. This is real kid glove stuff. And their answers are risibly simplistic as well. For example, the book tackles the question of whether the teaching of Vatican II is in continuity with previous church teaching. Now, this is a massive topic about which probably tens of thousands of pages have been written by people way more knowledgeable than Madrid, Veer, or myself. And yet, this question is it's dismissed by pointing to the footnotes in the documents of Vatican II. That's right, they say that Vatican II must be in continuity with previous councils simply because if you look in the documents of Vatican II, you can find citations from Trent and Vatican I. And, you know, if, if Vatican II wasn't in continuity, then how could it have footnotes from previous councils? Now, anyone who is even remotely academic knows that a citation alone doesn't mean anything. There are all sorts of ancillary issues that relate to the value of a citation. How is the citation used? What is being cited? Is the context the same as in the source? Does what is being cited contribute anything to the point, or is it just fluff? And you see a lot of fluff citations in Vatican II. For example, Lumen Gentium, Chapter 3, Section 18, has a lengthy paragraph about the unity of the episcopate under Peter. And it cites section 4 of Vatican I's Pastor Eternus, which is uh, Denzinger 1821 in the new numeration. So if we look this passage up, if we look up Denzinger 1821 from Pastor Eternus, we see that the, the source being cited is just a very general statement that merely says that Peter was the head of the apostles who were united beneath him. Now, this is such a general statement that one cannot argue continuity or even discontinuity from it. it, it it's just a very general point. You can't establish continuity merely by citing the broadest, most general statements of, of the Bible or, uh, or, or previous councils. Even heretics can quote scripture. The devil quotes scripture. I could easily write a mass of heresies and quote councils left and right. For example, I could argue for a, uh, a Unitarian Islamic conception of God, and I could quote the statement from Lateran IV's Profession of Faith that, quote, there's only one God eternal and immeasurable in support. And then I could say that my teaching was in continuity with Lateran IV because after all, I quoted it 
Now, would my citation of Lateran IV prove that I was somehow in continuity with that council? Of course not. You would want to know the context of what it was citing and how it related to the argument I was trying to make. Merely suggesting that Vatican II is in continuity with previous teaching just because we can find citations to other councils in the footnotes, it's probably the weakest defense of conciliar continuity I have ever heard. And and Madrid and Veer give it about a page and a half in the book, and then they, they just brush their hands and say, well, problem solved. I can understand that this sort of book would be written in 2004. We were still three years away from Samorum Pontificum, and with an almost total absence of diocesan Latin masses, it's understandable that, for many, traditionalism was the SSPX. While some excellent critiques of the Council and the New Mass had been produced, we were still years away from the kind of systematic analysis of the Novus Ordo, such as we have seen in recent times, and I want to specifically mention the excellent work of Matthew Hazel. Traditionalist Catholic media at that time was only in its infancy, and the pop apologists basically controlled the field, able to dictate the parameters and content of their arguments however they wished. Many traditionalists themselves had not yet fully worked out their own arguments. So I can totally forgive Patrick Madrid and Pete Veer for writing something like this. What is much less forgivable is that these sorts of arguments are still being marshaled today against the traditional movement. With the publication of works like Dr. Kwasniewski's The Once and Future Roman Rite, or Matthew Hazel's Index Lexionum, or many other books and essays that traditionalists have been churning out over the past several years, the opponents of traditionalism can no longer get away with what Madrid and Veer did 18 years ago. Church Life Journal's recent piece, The Renewal of the Liturgy, Successes, Failures, and Contemporary Concerns by John Cavadini, Mary Healy, and Thomas Wanandi is a perfect example. Now, this article has been relentlessly savaged elsewhere, and I'm not going to waste time on it. Safe to say to the authors that 2004 called, and they want their arguments back. The intellectual momentum is entirely with the traditionalists now. And even then, when I picked this book up in 2004, I remember finding it disappointing. I was disappointed that it chose to tackle straw men rather than address substantial traditionalist critiques of the council. I was disappointed that it stayed so grounded in council documents rather than the history of how the council actually unfolded. I was disappointed that it said almost nothing about the changes to the Mass or offered any comparison of the traditional Roman Rite to that of Paul VI. I could tell even then that the book's arguments were weak, and now, returning to it after 18 years, the passage of time has thrown the weaknesses of this book into even greater relief, along with the entire ideology it represented, an ideology which is already crumbling everywhere and ready to disappear.